Hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening panel of Horasis. Uh, if you've been with us all day, we wanted to make sure to end the day on a high note. And so we've got a fantastic panel with a very aspirational topic, fostering shared humanity. Um, amid an entrenched pandemic, we have a rare but brief opportunity to rethink, reimagine, and repurpose our world. What are the seed pods of shared solutions to solve the existential challenges facing businesses, governments, and humanity at large? And how can we nurture the deep transformations that we're going to need to go forward? Now, I was very excited actually when I was invited to moderate this particular panel because this mission or this question is actually the mission of Doha Debates. And it's a lot of what we do. And so I was, you know, just love the idea of having four brilliant people who are doing fantastic work in the world and making the world a better place uh, talk to us about how we can use this moment. So I'm going to briefly introduce our guests. Joel Moser is the founder and CEO at Aquamarine Investment Partners, an investment fund focused on energy transition. He also teaches at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a founding and executive committee member of the advisory board of the Columbia University Global Energy Policy Center. Deanna Mao is the co-founder and president of NOMI Network. Deanna is an abolitionist with a mission to eradicate human trafficking in her lifetime. She is a 2015 Presidential Leadership Scholar, New York Academy of Medicine Fellow, and co-chaired the Nexus Human Trafficking Modern Day Slavery Workgroup from 2013 to 2019. Robert Locascio is the founder and CEO of Live Person and has been its chief executive officer since its inception in 1995, leading it to becoming a leader in intelligent engagement solutions, currently serving over 18,000 clients with 1,000 employees across the globe. Rob has also, in 2001, started the Dream Big Foundation with its first program, Feeding New York City, which gives families in, in need a Thanksgiving dinner. To date, Feeding NYC has donated more than 40,000 meals its second program, the Dream Big Entrepreneurship Initiative, launched in 2014, funds, mentors, coaches, and empowers local entrepreneurs in underserved communities. And Josh Cohen is the founder and partner at City Light Capital. Josh also co-founded and is a board member of The Impact, a member network whose mission is to inspire families to make impact investments more effectively. He's also on the board of directors for Ready Responders and Ginger.io and is an advisor to Ohm Con Connect. Throughout it all, Josh addresses issues such as education for underserved communities, tackling the global climate crisis and keeping families safe. That's just a little bit of what they do. And so uh, we'd use up all, the whole 45 minutes if we were going to talk about all of the accomplishments and all the things they're working on. I'm your moderator, I'm Atullah. I'm also the man, uh, managing director of Doha Debates. I'm very pleased to be with you today. So the, uh, basically our question, we have a lot of reasons for optimism, the way the world has responded to this pandemic, but we also have reasons for concern. The pandemic has been a shared collective experience. It's hard to imagine. There have been a lot of moments when the whole world felt that moment, but in this one, everyone is impacted to the individual level. Not everybody has been impacted the same. Not every demographic has been impacted the same, but everyone has felt the, the weight of the pandemic and of COVID. It's been a shock to our collective psyche as humans. Some people, businesses, governments, they've all responded in different ways. In some ways, that's been it's been very good. There's been a tremendous collective action and innovation. There have been vaccines in record times that have been uh, developed in places as far flung as Cuba, the United States, Europe, uh, China, Russia, India, uh, and other countries, I'm sure as well. Uh, on the other hand, there's also and 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 a lot of companies have been held to a greater level of scrutiny and accountability on issues like diversity, equity, and inclusion. But there's also been a splintering, um, greater selfishness as individuals and as nations. We see com we see competition, uh, even among European states. We saw competition in the United States among our own states uh, for 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 supplies, uh, for PPE, personal protection equipment. 
Most of all, the inequities in our global system have become more obvious than ever before. But they were always here, but we, we can, it's harder to, to not notice them now. So the question I'll ask each of you is how do we use this moment to make things better? And how do we do it collectively? So I want to start with Joel. Thank you. That was an excellent introduction and an excellent question that you framed. We in the energy and, and infrastructure community have responded to the uh, pandemic by observing that it, it is, in a way, among so many other things, a, a live fire drill, a live fire test for what the world can do collectively to respond to a global challenge. Uh, and keying off the, the, the topic of our panel, shared humanity, how, how will, will, we, will we act at our shared humanity or selfish interest? Because climate change is the ultimate global challenge that requires collective action. And when you think about it, as you noted, we didn't do so well. In fact, while there were so many successes by the pharmaceutical industry and many valiant performances, there, there was not a lot of global collective action. In fact, just the opposite. Climate change is going to respond, going to require very significant global collective action. Well, in pandemic, we've learned a few things, uh, some of them not so good. We learned that um, the, the shutdown of the economy, which occurred, only marginally reduced carbon dioxide emissions. Very disappointing findings that we traded time in the office, energy use in the office for energy use at home. We swapped mass transportation use for individual automobile use. We only slightly reduced the utilization of carbon-based fuels and carbon emissions. We will all be back up in gangbusters anytime soon. So we know the framing of the question, we know the challenge, but, um, but we have an opportunity here. And that is lots and lots of money is being thrown at the solution to the economic wreckage from the pandemic. So with the expenditure of money, we do have opportunities. But the question is how it's spent. Um, the European Union has actually included within some of its COVID response uh, green energy, climate, climate-related initiatives. So that's a good start. The European Union often on the cutting edge of these issues. In the United States, there has just been passed a massive COVID relief bill. Um, and the next step is a look at infrastructure investment. Now, you might not think that infrastructure is a topic that falls within shared humanity, but stay with me for a minute. Infrastructure shapes how we live. Infrastructure shapes where we live, how we live, how we move around. And new infrastructure is effectively forever. Infrastructure lasts decades. How we build infrastructure now will frame and define how life is led over time. So it's important to make the right decisions collectively. So maybe don't right away <laughs> fix all the roads, which is the first impulse. Maybe first thing we need to do is improve our power grid to move renewable energy from where it's produced easily to where it's most used. Maybe the first thing needs to be mass transit investment. If we invest in the wrong things, if we make these decisions based upon expediency or profit or regional pride or the kind of selfish regionalism or nationalism which we saw underlying some of the responses to the pandemic, we're going to fail, and we're going to fail in a permanent way. So it's important as we look now at what is the ultimate collective global challenge to learn some of the lessons from the pandemic and respond in an appropriate fashion. This is the, 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 what we yearn for now is a return to normalcy. I yearn for it, we all yearn for it. I think that's wrong. I think that's, that is wrong because normalcy, if that means 2019 behavior, we are on a collision course to disaster. We need to yearn for something new, a new way to live, a new way to work, collectively built on our global humanity, our shared humanity, to respond to this global challenge in a way that's going to save the planet. Thank you, Joel. 
and and I guess I'm gonna get I'm I'm gonna get back to you on this, but I really would love to hear your thoughts on how we avoid the inertia of wanting to do everything the way we were doing everything. I mean, I think of myself as in just personally in my own personal life, right? I know that I have a high carbon footprint. Uh, the way I live, the way I work, uh, I travel a lot, I fly a lot. This year I have I haven't traveled at all. Um, but I can't wait to get back on an airplane and meet all of you in person and go to conferences in real life, et cetera. Um, and yeah, how do I, how do you overcome even on a, on a national level and on an individual level, that inertia to just wanting to do it the same way? Do you want me to res- can, shall yeah. I, may I respond? Sure. The answer is, and this may, you may think I'm trying to take you off the hook, but I'm not. I'm going to give you a, a bigger challenge. You cannot personally solve this problem. It is a collective problem. It is a problem that needs to be solved. The, 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 what needs to happen is not for you to fly less, but for our national and regional governments and, our, and internationally to build power grids that move renewable energy around. For us to, to create public policy incentives to bring the price of low carbon and no carbon fuels down low enough so that it's, it competes with carbon-based fuel. This the global climate change is the ultimate collective challenge. And it, you, rather than fly less, if you take, if you contribute to candidates who will vote for policies that are, that are in favor of climate initiatives, that is a better use of your, of your personal capital than to, to try to reduce your individual carbon footprint. It is, it is a collective challenge, not an individual challenge. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Like, Actually, and I, and I believe that's the. I'm sorry, Josh. You wanted to jump in. I was going to say I, I might disagree a little bit. I, I actually think that it's a, it's not an or solution. It's an and solution. And so, yes, uh, you should consider your voting and your investments and your behavior and your consumption. None of these things are going to be a silver bullet. And so, uh, to the extent that you're not willing to travel less, you may want to consider purchasing off, offsets or enabling your house with IOG devices so there's more flexibility in the usage. You can participate in local demand response. Um, I think this is something that's big enough that we all have a role to play. And so to the extent you can think about all of the tools in your tool belt, uh, it enhances the likelihood of success. I I agree. I'm not suggesting that we should not look at our own personal carbon footprint, but things like building a new subway in an urban center or the imposition of a carbon tax these are the things that are going to really move the needle. Yes, we should all individually do our individual part, but but my, my point is that it's the it's we, we no individual can 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 impose a carbon tax in the United States or a global carbon tax. No individual is going to build new subway stops to make it more likely that people will will use mass transit. That's my that's my basic point. I'm not in any way suggesting just go fly all you want and don't feel bad about it. I'm saying that that, that that alone will not do it. It needs to be the collective, collective which is going to get us where we need to get to. Thank you. Thank you both. Let me go to Deanna now, because Deanna, your work is existentially important to the lives of literally millions and millions of people. Um, I think the, the issue that you work on is probably uh, probably one of the most unreported, underreported, but most problematic issues that we face uh, today. And I can only imagine that it's been made worse under the, in the last year. So love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, just thinking around the concept of fostering a shared humanity and so difficult when, you know, in our world today, there are more people in slavery than at any moment in time, 40, over 40 million people in slavery and about 70% of them are women and girls. Um, And, you know, you and I might be thinking, okay, you know, we live in San Francisco, we live in New York, we live in these metropolitan cities. How does my life perpetuate slavery? And, you know, I can say everybody in the room perpetuates slavery in some way. And statistically, it is significant. Um, 68% of uh, slavery is attributed to labor. And of that, our goods, about 60, over 60% of raw materials contain 
forced our child labor. So that's cacao, which is in chocolate, coffee, cotton, particularly made in, in countries um, like Uzbekistan. You know, there are systematic um, real <laughs> forces that drive this very lucrative industry. I mean, over 150, 160 billion dollar industry. And so for um, those individuals, you know, whether they're in India or whether they're in the United States, such as Dallas, which has the third highest prevalence of human trafficking in the United States, these are individuals that are hidden. These are individuals that suffer immensely, especially in the uh, season of COVID. It's like a pressure cooker. You know, for example, I mentioned primarily women are sex trafficked in, and in India, uh, half the world's population of those in slavery actually reside in India. And so during COVID, you know, with all the massive shutdown, you had mass migration of migrant workers, daily wage laborers in Delhi and Mumbai and more urban areas having to walk thousands of miles to get back to the north where are, these are the villages that they live. You know, many of these villages do not have access to potable water, electricity. Um, local governments frequently dumps trash. You can walk into a village and just literally in the wintertime, all you smell is burnt trash. And these are the places I've personally visited and I've seen, you know, and I ask myself, this is this humanity? Is this what we've resorted to where, um, you know, who's, who, who is who gets to define um, who's human and who is not living in these circumstances? And I would say because of COVID, um, it's gotten more violent and even more hidden. And then also now with many displaced workers around the world, even those that were not perhaps vulnerable to human trafficking, sex or labor trafficking, are actually now in the vulnerable category of being susceptible to human trafficking. And so it really impacts everything that we touch from supply chain to the products that we wear to the uh, food that we eat. And so I feel like during this COVID season, you know, as individuals, I would say particularly um, millennials um, that are very keen on researching everything they consume, including myself, you know, we, we have more time to do that ultimately. So there's a lot of consumption pattern shifting. And, you know, I would say, practically speaking, um, many of my peers actually vote with their purchases. And if they do hear of instances, you know, in factories, et cetera, their voices are heard. Um, and I think it'll only get larger and larger because of social media, because of real massive awareness and, um, also more and more individuals that have access to information in real time. You know, if there's a factory worker being exploited in Cambodia, that could potentially go viral. I mean, there is a Norwegian group of tweens that um, years ago created a documentary where they went to factories and somehow got in and hit a camera and was documenting everything happening. And these are tweens from Norway. And so with that, you know, level of awareness, I think companies are – really looking at not just ESG, but also applying a human rights lens in their in their portfolio and their investments as well. And I, I'm speaking to more and more investors that are really taking those metrics very seriously in all of their investments. And then secondly, I also feel that um, more and more factories and employers, you know, want to work with uh, nonprofits and, you know, institutions that are addressing this issue um, and the biggest way to address this issue at this moment is really to get people back to work and to really create opportunities for those that are um, in the extremely vulnerable category. So there are companies, you know, for example, Hilti, a very large uh, construction company based in Europe, also with a strong presence in the U.S. They might not typically hire interns in high school that are formerly incarcerated, you know, having been trafficked and somehow ended up in detention, Right. But they're willing to do it. And this is a very a real game changer and a shift. Typically companies large, you know, when they look at criminal records, they're like, well, like, I'm not sure I want to hire this person. There's a lot of liability with HR. But I do see a shift with companies now willing to actually work um, to get individuals that they normally wouldn't hire and remove these barriers in recruitment 
and these real um, you know, criminal record is a huge issue in the United States as well, and being willing to give people a chance. And I think that level of compassion and empathy really rose up during during COVID season as well. I mean that you know that's amazing. It's do you feel that the changes that these companies are able to make or willing to make are they driven from what you were talking about earlier, the Generation Z and millennials, you know, voting with their or or voting with their pocketbooks, you know, making sure that being more aware of everything that they're you know being aware of the price of an avocado in real life or being aware of the price of cocoa or yeah is, is that what's driving the change or is it is it is it the more general systematic awareness you think i think it's a combination of external and um, internal external i know i have friends that run companies that are uh, more smaller on the consumer uh, fashion product side and during blm they received a lot of social media nudges and that's what led the founder to make a massive donation to BLM. So, so you know, you have the external pressure of social media. Not everyone, frankly, cares about social media, but there are actually brands that are very much, um, you know, the metrics that they look at, Instagram and and conversions are very high in the consumer product space. So I would say that. And then internally, um, you know, from working directly with companies like Hilti and Shahi and large organizations. There, you know, there is that data of the wealth wealth transition to millennials. Well, with that comes like corporate board seats. With that comes also more executive leadership, and so those leaders are actually really pushing for these initiatives and um, you know advocating for the most vulnerable um, or issues like the environment, etc. And so I would say that's also a driving force. Great, thank you. Okay, so let's go to Robert next. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a, a perspective that I, I started my company in 95 and then, um, you know, I took it public in, in 2000 and sort of lived through the dot-com and then 9-11, we were in New York then took the company through the financial crisis and now the, the what we have today with COVID. And when it started, you know, I, I talked to my leadership team and said, we, we have to lead, we'll lead through with empathy. Because what I found previously with macro environments is, you know, people, your employees feel really out of control. And what they want you to do is listen to them. They don't want you to just try to like rah, rah them through something, especially has to do with life and death. And I remember this when I was facing, we watched the towers come down in New York City at the time and leading employees through this feeling that we could get, you know, physically hurt. And what I found as a leader, we have 1,300 employees around the world, about half in the U.S., half outside the U.S., is the, the COVID, like any macro environment, well, I wrote something on my wall behind my, my desk in my home office, which was, you know, what is, the, what is the virus asking us to change? Because the virus is nothing more. We have viruses. They, we're, we have viruses in us right now. I mean, obviously, this one has had a major impact in our world, but – but there's a message that comes with this. And what I felt for the first time in my company is that our employees want us to take a much different relationship with them than ever in the past. And so they want us to think about their health and wellness. Their, you know, they want us to think about their families, their education of their children. You know, since we're not in offices, and normally the, the, the contract we had with, our, with employees is that, we sign you your paycheck. You get your paycheck every week, and you take care of the rest of it. And, yes, we're providing health insurance. Yes, we have wellness programs. Yes, we have principles where we are a, a culture-based business. Yes, we help the community. But the things that they're asking us to do. So when Black Lives Matter hit, it, it, it was the impact was very different than anything I saw, even during the financial crisis when you had Occupy Wall Street, okay, and what was going on there. Because there was already something hanging around the world we live in about inequality and enough is enough. And there's a sense that business leaders and companies um, have to play a part in bringing community together and starting with your employees. And so 
I could have ignored it and said, you know, whatever, we'll just, this will pass over and I don't really care. And I don't, but like, you know, I, what, it's, what, you know, what I'm seeing and what's happening in the world is uh, the world is asking us as business leaders to take a different hand in the world we live in. Everything's shifted, kind of shifted from I to we. You know, it's, it's about not just we as the people internally in our company, but the communities in which they serve. And I remember when Black Lives Matter I, I happened, I had a, a Zoom call with our employees of color and, and, and people, and I said, how are you feeling? And they, they said, we feel scared. We feel scared. And we went through this whole thing with them. And, and, and then, you know, it, it was a reflection. I look at my leadership team and, and how are we on diversity? And we've talked about diversity. And we, have, we do have like 30% of our engineering town are women, and that's pretty good for technology. But I thought about, like, I, I as a leader, in many ways, just um, I'm a tech company. So I could just kind of go with what was happening and say having – 15, 20% of our employees of diverse population, that's great. And we did our best look at finding people from, from diverse populations really hard in tech, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, my mindset has changed. You know, and whatever bias I have, it starts with me. I say, I have to change. Therefore, I want 50% of my company now to be diverse, women or people of color. And so, you know, what I, what it's, this is something very good that's happened to us. This is how I look at all macro events, not people passing away and dying and the things that have happened in sickness, but there was things that just weren't getting done. So as much as we may say the environment's going to get, it will get done now. I can promise you diversity, equality will get done faster than I believe it, it happened in the past because as I, I, I saw the Dalai Lama speak many years ago, and it was, it was when we were fighting the war in Iraq, and I remember I have people who are Iraqis getting killed. I remember saying, it didn't make difference. They're not Americans. It obviously Americans were getting killed, soldiers. But we, you weep from that. You feel that. So this, what this virus has done is asked us a lot of different questions. And I think I'm very hopeful that uh, many of us are going to react and change. Uh, even if we've been doing good things, we need to do better. Thank you, Robert. That's actually, it's really beautiful. How, how do you think, you know, you're, and now that you've said this, I'm thinking to Tim Cook and I'm thinking to uh, a lot of the other CEOs who've, you know, tried to come out and, um, you know, make statements first on behalf of BLM or uh, on behalf of uh, diversity. Um, what would your recommendation to other CEOs be on how to systematize this so that it's not, you know, it, it's not a in the moment thing, but it becomes how we live going forward. It's very easy. First of all, it doesn't start by hiring somebody to run diversity in your company. That's a very easy thing to do. That's a cop out. It may, it may be part of the solution, but the, one, the number one thing I did was say, we're going to hire I go to my, the people who, the, the people we're going to hire this year, about 700 people. And we will hire a lot of people who are not white males because I've said we're going to do that. It's not about a DNI person to educate us. We need to be surrounded and hire the right people, people who are, uh, and, and that's the only way we're going to make it. So my goal is over the next three years that 50% of our entire company being fully of women, people of color, diversity and not white males, even though I'm a technology company. So it's hiring. I said, it's very simple. I don't want to hire Dean. They tell us how to sit us down and talk to things. Yes, but hire people because here's what it is. I found one thing. I am biased. We just need to admit it. It's implicit. I'm not a racist. I don't, I don't have that in my thing. My parents were immigrants, right? My grandparents. I had this sense that when they came over, they were discriminated against. I heard the stories. It doesn't matter. There's something in there. Because if I look at my management team, look what it is. Why is it reflected? Because we feel comfortable with people like ourselves. We need to admit it. So the best thing I can do is when I'm on a Zoom is have a bunch of people that don't look like me. 
And then you, the way you change your language, because, you know, I, you know, if you have women in a bunch of meetings, you're going to, as a man, you may change your language. You may think about why you say something because it may be a sense of, so it's the same thing. If you surround yourself with people, you will change because you're going to become aware of how you're talking, how you're thinking. And today we're not aware. So we just did meetings with the people who kind of look like us and we're like, this feels good. We got a couple, but we're diverse with 20% of our population. It's not good enough. The problem I know is that I want to hire the best employees in the world. Now here's what COVID did. We have a new policy that, you know, it's, it's, it's be anywhere, be anyone, be anywhere, be anyone. I don't have to hire people in New York and Seattle. I'm going to hire them in every corner of the world. Now I can get very diverse. I don't have an excuse because I had 20 offices. Now I got a million offices around the world, you know, virtually. And that's how I look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, why don't we go to you now? Yeah, one of the things that Robert said that I was uh, particularly intrigued by was kind of the reaction to the pandemic and and what we how we reacted to it, what we learned from it, what the pandemic tells us to do. And uh, for me, the two things that were most pressing over the last 12 months was just, it was a reminder of my priorities. And, and I'm not sure it dra- my priorities drastically changed, but I do think they were brought to a forefront. Um, and I have a renewed sense of urgency and a reminder that life can be short. Right. Like, so um, when I started in my impact investing journey in 2004, it was really a reaction to 9 11 and the, the events at Ground Zero, in which I had a similar reaction. Like I, I felt like I was living in a hypocritical life. I was on this path where I was going to make a bunch of money in tech and in finance, and I was going to turn 75 or 80 years old, and I was going to become a philanthropist and live out my values. Uh, and I, I took that moment of realization and set out to take my background as a capitalist and investment banker and a technology entrepreneur and, and, and focus that on finding entrepreneurs and partnering with companies that were designed to prevent the next 9-11. And then I got involved in education and climate and other areas. And, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that I've realized is if you're going to use this moment with a productive sense of urgency and a renewed focus on where your priorities lie, you kind of have to do that on purpose and with purpose. Um, that we have to think about not just uh, our voting, not just our consumption, but we have to leverage all of the tools in our tool belt. And I'm hoping that this is one of those moments where capitalism becomes a, and people's investment portfolio becomes something that they can use as part of their problem solving portfolio in a way that brings different technologies, different perspectives, different types of talents. And isn't to say that one's better than the other. It's just, you know, the way I'm, I'm wired is if you're focused on solving something, you should do it by any means necessary and as fast as humanly possible. And in this country and in this world, we've been attempting to solve problems uh, by looking for a silver bullet and by not using all of the means that are disposable. And so hopefully that will change. Um, so I, I'm going to double down on using impact investing as part of my problem solving portfolio and, and happy to offer my experience and, and uh networks that I'm a part of to, to allow people to explore that as an option and uh, allow them to progress on their journey as, as, as impact investors. One of the areas where I'm pointing my impact investing these days is in the area of mental health. Um, I've spent a lot of time dealing in markets like you know, gunshot detection and crime prevention and a lot of the areas uh, that, were, that lead to social problems one of the root causes for dealing with those inevitabilities is the presence of mental health or, or mental instability. And so I'm hoping that there's a renewed focus and they reduce associated with mental health. Mental health is something that affected 20% of the population in the U S prior to COVID. And based on a CNN report a few weeks ago, that number is now 55% and that's likely understated. And so you're talking about over 150 million people, that have some sort of enhanced stress, anxiety, ranging all the way to things like, you know, bipolar and beyond. Uh, And so to the extent that we can increase access, affordability, and ultimate outcomes in a manner that uh, allows uh, the the broader population to manage these things and to, uh, to thrive in whatever their objectives are, I think that will go a long way to uh, allowing people to be their best selves. And, And I'd like to spend uh, the next portion of my life contributing to uh, to progressing that conversation and 
bringing new technologies and attracting new entrepreneurs to solving some of those problems. Well, thank you, Josh. Josh, so you know the world of impact investment. I mean, I don't, but you do. And you, I'm, I, I think it's profound that you're working on uh, and, and directing people towards things that are helping with mental health, which has been so under covered. Maybe climate in the, cl the global warming and the necessity of climate change has become more of a, I mean, we've become more publicly aware of it than we have maybe even of uh, the human trafficking and, and modern day slavery. But how, how much are those issues also part of, from what you see going on in the, in the United States, at least of impact investment, how much are people looking at, how much do, you, do people ask you about, you know, about those issues and, and how their money can be, you know, best invested so that they're not contributing to the problem? Yeah, look, in six, the last 16 years of being an impact investor, I, I've learned two things that I'm pretty sure of. Like one is I'm much better at convincing people to invest in things that they already care about. And so people show up with their own biases, whether it's around human trafficking or it's around climate. Uh, but the acuteness of the problem is directly related to kind of the world in which they live and, and how they're influenced, whether it's by media or whether it's by uh, current events. One of the reasons why people are focused on climate is because you're seeing massive effects of uh, weather fluctuations in ways that we've never seen before. And so whether it's, you know, power outages in Texas or increased uh, earthquakes or heat, heat strokes or whatever it may be, like the extremes are rising in ways that has a tangible effect. Um, you know, I would say that I, I heard more uh, interest around pandemic recovery than anything else over the last 12 months. Um, I think that climate is uh, is tied into that story, and certainly there are people in hard to reach and low income neighborhoods, and pollution contributed to the spread of the pandemic in many ways. And so, all of these things are interconnected. Uh, and I think that that we have a responsibility to explore these things in whatever manner in which we can. So, as it relates to climate, like, look, um, I think there's a renewed interest. Some of that, candidly, that comes from lots of places. Some of that has to do with uh, weather and extremes. Some of that has to do with Elon Musk, right? There is a, he was recently voted the most uh, admired entrepreneur in the world, and, and there is sex appeal that comes with that. And so there's a generation of entrepreneurs saying, look, I want to build businesses like Elon, and I think that, that that will have positive ramifications in areas like climate and energy. Um, I also think that there is a, uh, a groundswell of support from uh, younger generations uh, that are focused on these things and louder about these things in ways that are moving markets, right? When you think about what just happened with, with Robinhood, you're seeing uh, the reach of retail investors like you haven't seen before and the power of their voice is moving markets. Uh, all of these things combine to create a perfect storm of opportunity. And the question is, how do people like us respond? Thank you. So let me ask all of you a question. What do you think are the biggest impediments moving forward for the work that you're doing? I mean, the empathy that you're talking about, Robert, the, 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 the changes in the way people use their money, the way capitalism is used, Josh, uh, Joel, the, the, um, you know, people, like you say, I mean, recognize the global, most people recognize the global warming is, is an existential threat, but it's a still still everybody still imagines that it's something we're worried about for our grandchildren uh, as opposed to something that we're worried about for ourselves. Um, I mean, are there are there structural impediments in our way that we need to make sure do not use this moment um, of the pandemic to kind of retrench the way things were? Anyone. I'll go out on a limb a little bit um, and uh, say, you know, you can see in the, in the political, political environment in the U.S., which I, 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 I don't study politics around the world, but my understanding is it's not all that different than many other democracies. You basically have a viewpoint that is progressive challenged by a viewpoint that is not. And there is an intersection of racism and misogyny and anti-intellectualism and 
um, nationalism and which overlap in a way and are reflected in, in what we saw happen in Washington on January 6th, what we see happening. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is you've got, you know, I, I, you know, on the investment side, you have a thought of someone who's out of a, an aspirational figure like Elon Musk. You also have Alexandra Casio cortez who was one of the most influential public figures in America, who my climate people would say she didn't get it all right, but she really moved the ball with her Green New Deal. This is the conflict. Um, I don't know which side wins, but that's the headwind, is that there are a lot of people on the other side of each of these issues, and somehow they're sort of on the other side of all of these issues. That's what we face. Diana, what are, yeah. what, are, what, are you, what are the biggest challenges you think we need to overcome? I would say, um, you know, just even thinking about the private sector, there are just a lot of structural, um, you know, existing pricing models that frankly make it very difficult when you get to tier three, the cotton, the thread, the zipper, um, in terms of pricing and, you know, second tier subcontract factories are oftentimes squeezed and that puts a lot of pressure on people. So people that are exploited in these circumstances and frankly, you know, with COVID and a lot of the sectors being displaced like hospitality, retail, food, these are all sectors that traditionally, you know, take in blue collar work, you know, individuals that don't, um, are not as competitive in the sector that afford us to be working from Zoom or working from home. And so I would say structurally, they're just, um, you know, and I don't have an answer. I mean, it could be the government, um, you know, really looking at policies that would um, either the carrot or stick approach to make sure we get people back to work and those that are most vulnerable. But I would say really looking at that um, system and COVID is definitely the opportunity to do that, given that there are a lot of displaced sectors that um, you know could use some collaboration, I would say, at this point, and really thinking in terms of the shared humanity mindset, um, I would say is an opportunity as well as a challenge. And Robert, so you've you've not only had your company survive but thrive through multiple crises that have happened. Okay, so most. People haven't been able to do that, right? I mean, they, they build a company, just then they build a new company, and 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 they hit the next headwind. But you've actually managed to to do this, uh, which is you know relatively, I think, unique, uh, and and grow it. And you know, you've reached, you you've taken it to. I mean, I'm I'm noticing here, Sarah's in in uh, commenting. She loves the mantra of your company at Live Person: Our most extraordinary intelligence isn't artificial. Um, the, the, you probably better than anyone know how to overcome hurdles. What's, what's, do you see the pandemic now offering, do you see any headwinds? Do you, do you think it's, do you see the next headwind coming up? No, I, I, first of all, there's a lot of people unemployed, which has, it's got, it's a two-sided coin. And uh, when I graduated in 90, there was a recession coming on. And I became an entrepreneur and I started my first company at 195. Then I started this one. I was broke and you know, did the entrepreneurial story and we've done well. This will create a lot of opportunity. People do not like to sit, sit around and starve. And even though there are a lot of people obviously in hurting positions, humans tend, the basics is survival. So there's two parts to that. One is that people are going to be, there's going to be a lot more entrepreneurism in, in areas that we never envisioned because people are going to put their good time to good use. The second part is they're going to put that with a frame, with a, with a viewpoint of helping others in community because of the pain that they're experiencing themselves. So, you know, like that, that's, that's where they're coming from. And I think ultimately one of the biggest threats that's breaking down. It's gone. In my mind, it's already gone. Like Facebook is gone. Facebook does not exist anymore. It, it exists here, but we can see that 
it's path and journey. It's a not trusted brand. It's just a matter of time. But the things that I say are big, big tech, big companies like banks, they've been treating us as people like numbers and consumers and, and we're not humans. We're not, we're not treated with the respect we deserve. And so they're going to go away. And I, I think they are the greatest threat because when you put a cage, when you put an animal that's threatened into a corner, they pretty much come out trying to kill. And they have a lot to lose by losing their power, but they're going to lose it. If you look at what's happening with blockchain, if you look at the stuff I've been, like that's a major shift in the web and technology. There's so much of that going on that the individual will get more power now. And, and I believe it'll shift from 